Black Star Network is here. I'm real um, revolutionary right now. Wow. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roller. Hey, Black, I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be skate. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig?
22nd, 2024, coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered, streaming live on the Black Star Network. The situation in Haiti is worsening as gains continue to wreak havoc on the innocent and the country's transitional government struggles to take shape. Retired Army Lieutenant General Russell Honore has an idea saying that America needs to stop holding back the military from being able to access weapons. We'll talk about that with him on the show. Netflix's uh, biopic on Shirley Chisholm, called Shirley, dropped today. Tonight, you'll hear from Robert Gottlieb, a white man who worked on her presidential campaign, uh, and we'll talk about what that was like and how he learned a whole lot working for Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm. Plus, uh, we will hear from Congresswoman Barbara Lee, who also worked in that campaign, Plus, the producers of the movie, Raina King and her sister, Oscar-winning actress, Regina King. Folks, uh, Republican Alabama Governor Kay Ivey signed a law prohibiting state funding for maintaining, sponsoring, endorsing, promoting, or affirming DEI progress. The chair of Alabama's Democratic Conference will join us on the show. Plus, Congressman David Trone is apologizing Using the word jigaboo when talking about Republicans. What was he thinking? We'll tell you. It's time to bring the funk. I'm Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. Congressman David Trone, who is the front runner for the Democratic nomination for U.S. Senator in Maryland, is apologizing after he used a racial slur in a congressional hearing while talking to a black White House leader. This is what took place in Congress. Just and government businesses don't make decisions on investment which creates the jobs based on the tax rate. I've made, in my past life, 
hundreds of millions of dollars of decisions each year on budgets and to build new buildings, build inner new states. And not one time ever in the history of my life did I say, what's the tax rate next year? What you look at is, can you compete? Can you do it better than the other competitor? And with that, can you create a P&L statement that works? And the tax rate, that's after the P&L. It's never, ever once been a consideration. So this Republican jigaboo that, you know, it's a tax rate that's stopping business investment, it's just completely faulty by people who've never run a business. They've never been there. They have not a clue what they're talking about. Something um, has to be done. Well, that was not quite um, what uh, he wanted to say. Uh, uh, after he was contacted by the Washington Post, Trone uh, released a statement, uh, and this is actually uh, what uh, he said. He said, today, while attempting to use the word bugaboo in a hearing, I misspoke and mistakenly used a phrase that is offensive. Upon learning the meaning of the word, I was deeply disappointed to have accidentally used it, and I apologize. As you see right here in the Washington Post story, Trump, who's 68, uh, is a Democrat. Uh, he's leading uh, the May 14th primary race, uh, and to succeed retired Senator Ben Cardin, of course, he's also running against uh, Angela Allsbrook, who is, of course, the Prince George's County executive uh, there as well. Let's go to our panel to get their thoughts uh, on this. Uh, joining us uh, from Corpus Christi, attorney Matt Manning. Glad to have Matt uh, on uh, tonight's show. Joining us uh, from uh, Detroit Motor City, uh, we've got uh, Michael. Michael joins us, of course, African History Network, Michael M. Hotel, African History uh, Network show coming from Detroit. Uh, see, we allow Sigmas on the show. Uh, and also, uh, Tyler McMillan. You look good, Roland. Tyler McMillan, he's a social justice leader, former national director, youth and What's college up, division of the National Network. We, wait a minute, hold up. We actually have two, <laughs> sigmas, two sigmas on the show. Oh. Uh, that's called. Um, uh, a record number. And what's still stunning to me is the fact I, that I meet two sigmas under the age of 55. Shocking. All right, <laughs> let's let's get let's get right into hey, this here. Let's get I right in, good. let's get right into this here. Matt, I'll start with you. And that is uh, he said he meant to use bugaboo, not jigaboo. Uh, Mealy apologizes. Um, just your thoughts. It's it's stupid. It's a uh, you know a poor choice of words, but without any further intent for it to be specifically harmful to someone, I think it is a an unfortunate faux pas. I think he and his team handled it correctly, made the immediate apology, and recognized that he didn't know the meaning of the word. Now I'll tell you, I don't know that any 68 year old white man in America does not know what jigaboo means. That's hard for me to believe. However. I can imagine that when you're speaking on something like this and you mix two words up, that kind of thing happens. So, I mean, without any further evidence to show that he was trying to be harmful, trying to slip something in, I think it was an unfortunate turn of phrase, and I think he apologized, and I think we move on from that. Uh, obviously, uh, Tyler, he was uh, talking to uh, Shalanda Young, who was over the Office of Management and Budget uh, for the Biden-Harris administration. Uh, and so uh, that uh, that uh, further compounded this. Plus, you have uh, this uh, Democratic primary uh, where you have a sizable black population, voting population in Maryland, running against, uh, he's competing against a prominent African-American executive. That's also why this has gotten a lot of attention. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, as we're looking at his, his campaign videos that has been posted, you know, throughout the area, uh, they're, they're painting him out to be this racial justice warrior. And so for someone who to be a racial justice warrior, I think he should be more mindful of the words that's coming out of his mouth. And as, as you know, was stated before, I don't understand at his age, at 68 years old, that he would not understand the, the context and the meaning of that word. Uh, but I think it was bizarre. But I, I, I don't, you know, looking at the context of it, I don't see that he used it in a racial slur. But I think someone his age uh, and someone who says to be a person um, shoulder to shoulder in this fight for racial and economic justice, he should know the meaning of, of the word in itself. Uh, and, you know, Michael, I, I always say all the time uh, that, you know, when words come out of your mouth, first of all, you then go, where did certain words come from? Uh, yeah. I like, for instance, I can't even tell you the, the possibility of jigaboo even coming out of my mouth is not even the words that I even use. 
Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, Roland, I think what happened was maybe he was around some Gen Xers and they were listening to Destiny's Child Bugaboo. All right. Or, and or, or, or he was that, watching Spike, Spike Lee's <laughs> school, Spike days. school Days. That's my name. So then he was watching School Days, right? And he has Jungle Fever, maybe, right? And he was watching School Days and he heard Jigaboo, okay? So then he throws that out and he gets the two terms mixed up. But this is, you know, um, I don't understand how he doesn't know what the term Jigaboo means. It's a derogatory term, you know, from African American for African Americans decades ago. Um, but it's good that his um, uh, spokespeople put out, well, it's good he put out a statement saying he misspoke, but I don't understand how you screw up the two terms. Uh, I don't use, I don't call people Jigaboos, and I'm black. <laughs> So I don't, I don't even know how something like that pops out unless it was in in the first place. So, you know, we'll see we'll see what happens with this. But, you know, um, it's good they put out a statement, but this is not the type of mistake that you want to make. Uh, look, I don't even use the N-word, so that... Me either. That doesn't even uh, come <laughs> out because I don't use it. So uh, we'll see if this has any impact on this May 14th primary. All right, folks, hold tight one second. We come back. We'll talk to Haiti. Uh, retired uh, General Russell Honore says there's something America can do to help Haitians. But the question is, will they actually do it? We'll discuss that next with him right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Tommy Davidson, I play Oscar on Proud Family, Louder and Prouder. Right now, I'm rolling with Roland Martin, unfiltered, uncut, unplugged, and undamn believable. You hear me? The situation in Haiti is getting worse day by day. The country's transitional government is struggling to take shape, and the island's uh, powerful gains continue to make advances in the capital, Port-au-Prince. Almost half of Haiti's people are struggling uh, to uh, feed themselves, uh, and several areas are literally close to famine. Security is an issue. Well, retired Army G Lieutenant General Russell Honore, many of us remember him for his work uh, after Hurricane Katrina, joins us right now. Uh, General Honore, glad to have you here. Uh, you talked about that there is something that America can do to help the security of the country that is in our control. Explain that. Yes, Roland, uh, thanks for uh, talking to this subject. Uh, Haiti has been ignored. Uh, not just this administration with the wars in Gaza and Ukraine going on and the own current election, but the uh, the entire mainstream media has been slow to report on what's happening in Haiti. Many times I think people get Haiti fatigued because going back to, and most of us can remember back to the earthquake, Haiti has never fully recovered. For instance, the United States has had four different ambassadors in Haiti in the last four years and currently operating with a charge affair. 
Uh, Haiti has not been a priority of the State Department. Uh, before it was uh, Gaza and Ukraine, it was Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, Haiti has never been uh, a priority, and it shows. Uh, look, we've been to Haiti, we've been engaged, we've invaded Haiti over more than you can count on one hand, and we still don't have a solution. We can't do something, Roland, by number one, we think the President of the United States need to address the people of Haiti to build confidence that we're going to do it different this time. We're going to use the people of Haiti to come up with their own plan, Haiti, led by Haitians, supported by the U.S. and the other international community. That's what needs to happen. We need the president to address this himself straight up right now. Well, and what you have is you have Republicans uh, who are, uh, let me know if we lost a general there. You've got Republicans uh, out here uh, who are yeah. trying to hype this situation, um, who um, they, they're out here talking about, oh, there's going to be a Haitian invasion of Florida. You've got Fox News scaring people to death, hyping this whole thing, which we all know is absolutely BS as well. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's really, um, you know, part of the issue. You talked about uh, a, uh, the need for an uh, ambassador to Haiti. Um, they, uh, that has actually happened. Um, go right here to my, um, if you go right here to my, uh, I, what's going to happen is you go to my iPad, check this out. Uh, this was just last week. I mean, you know, U.S. Senate confirms Biden nominee Hankins to be ambassador to Haiti. Um, and that is uh, Dennis Hankins, a career diplomat. Uh, and again, this is the first ambassador they've had in Haiti for two and a half years. He was confirmed in 89 uh, to one vote. He previously was ambassador to Mali uh, and Guinea. Uh, yeah. And so, but, but one of the things that you talked about was that that, that the United States controls weapons for the Haitian uh, military and police. Explain that to people who don't understand. Yeah, you, you, you're not going to believe this, Roland, but the Congress passed a rule that they would not supply weapons to the Haitian army and the Haitian police. Uh, nothing but pistols. Uh, that's when we tried to provide some armored vehicles last year to the Haitian government. They had to come from Canada and the United States flew them in because we got a rule in Congress that we will not arm the Haitian army. That is ridiculous. It uh, was probably done after repeated uh, coups happening in Haiti uh, out of an emotional response, but Haiti needs an army uh, to protect itself uh, and to back up the police. Uh, the democracy has not worked well in Haiti. Haiti's had very several opportunities to make it work, but outside influence and greed has destroyed the democratic process and the people that suffer are the poor people of Haiti. We need a rule change in the Congress supported by the White House. This is why the president needs to come out and explain to the American people what the hell's going on in Haiti and why is it so hard to get something there? Because most of the people in Haiti are reluctant of us to send the Marines in again like they were there for almost 10 years at one time, and they had the blue hat helmet uh, uh, UN soldiers there for over 10 years, and nothing improved. We need a plan, Haiti. Right now, the CARICOM, the Caribbean nations, have put forth eight or nine people. Most of them are from one political party, the, the uh, Montana party, who was sponsored by uh, Representative Maxine Waters and the old Aristide regime. The people of Haiti will not accept this proposed solution. And the Congress need to right. approve weapons going to the Haitian army and the Haitian police. To your we point, need the Haitians to solve this. To your point, uh, go to my iPad. This was an article uh, Jacqueline Charles, the award winning Caribbean correspondent for the Miami Herald, wrote in September 20, 2023. While international community is divided on Haiti, Haiti military, support for an army grows. In her article, it says there is one solution that Washington is not prepared to support, using the Haitian army. A State Department spokesperson told the Miami Herald that while the United States remains deeply concerned by the ongoing lawlessness associated with armed gangs and supports a Haitian-led solution, quote, the U.S. government is statutorily prohibited from providing assistance to the armed forces of Haiti. And so they go on to say that Haiti's modern-day military, created by U.S. Marines after 1915 American occupation, 
evolved into the army that became known as perpetrators of coups and some of the worst human rights abuses in the hemisphere. Now, the article says that Haiti has about 1,500 soldiers, but as, as you articulated, the article says they have no assault tanks, no armored vehicles, no combat helicopters, or even high-powered rifles, and lack any ability to confront gangs. While Mexico currently provides military training, the institution continues to face resistance from others in the international community, especially from the U.S. State Department. Okay, this real yeah. simple. How in the hell could you complain about security if the folk who should be providing security can't do rolling. it? Can you hear me? I'm not, I'm not in rolling. Can you hear me? Yeah, I got you rolling. Yeah, what's crazy is, how in the hell can we talk about security if the people who are supposed to be providing security can't provide security and the gangs uh, are overwhelming them because they got better weapons? Hello, this is the Western Hemisphere. We're supposed to be the boss here. We're supposed to be the boss in the rest of the We give Israel over $10 million a day and give Egypt over $10 million a day. Most years, we don't even give that much to, to Haiti to protect itself. We've got to change this, and it lies in the laps of the United States Congress, and we need to appeal to the president to speak to this. Just like he talk about Gaza, just like he talk about Ukraine, why in the hell the president ain't talking about Haiti? Great point. Go by panel, Michael. All right, uh, quick question here. Um, retired uh, Lieutenant General uh, Honoré. Um, I know that I read an article from uh, the grill.com that talked about how uh, Democrats in Congress want to send aid to Haiti, but Republicans won't budge. Um, can you talk about that for a minute? And then also, um, uh, Jake Sullivan um, announced that back up, uh, April Ryan reported for the grill.com on March 13th. Uh, Jake Sullivan announced uh, a total of $330 million, $333 million. Uh, in aid from uh, will go from the U.S. to uh, Haiti to address uh, political and humanitarian uh, crisis taking place. Can you talk about those, please? Yes, we get the money appropriated for Haiti, but not executed because the government there is not prepared to execute it. The humanitarian mm -hmm. money is being sent, but once the supplies arrive at the port, the gangs are in charge of the supply chain. So this is a uh, mm. a combined uh, problem of multiple scales. So we have to get the security to support the Haitian police and the Haitian army so they can open the supply routes. The gangs are controlling the majority of Port-au-Prince, and now they're going right. into the neighborhood because they live off of contraband. We've got to get the Congress to provide enough money to supply the army, the police, and to fund the army as the government. Uh, this is the Western Hemisphere. We give Israel over $10 million a day, and nobody say a damn thing about it every day. But, but here's the thing. Israel. Here's the thing, General. Look, you, you're a military man. First of all, look, I've never served in the military, but there's some basic stuff you know. First, you have to get control of the ground. That's right. first. I don't care. I don't care if we're talking about your house or we're talking about a country. That requires security. Once security gets control of the ground, then leadership then can make their decisions. Otherwise, they're running around scared to death because they're scared that the gangs are going to kidnap them, take them out. So the United States can talk all we want to. They can issue press releases, but you have to establish Security, you just said it, the supply uh, lines. Security must take back the roads, must take back the port, must take back the airlines, I mean, the airport. This, this ain't rocket science. It's really military one-on-one. Let me tell you something, Roland. Uh, if we had one Taliban or Russian in Haiti, we would have invaded it already. Mm -hmm. America is, is uh, focused on terrorists in the Middle East and from Russia. They don't give a damn about what's happening in Haiti. And it's time that the White House and the Congress change that attitude and we provide the assets that the Haitian government, as such as it is, as well as the army and the police, 
the supplies and the equipment and the training and the CIA operatives to go in there and start taking the damn gang leaders out. That's what needs to happen. But before I go to um, my next panel, this was a story that was uh, done uh, a couple of days ago. This, so General Lawyer Rich, Laura Richardson, commander yeah. of the U.S. Southern Command, she said during an event at the Atlantic Council, uh, we wouldn't discount that U.S. troops could be involved in an international effort in Haiti. Quote, we are prepared if called upon by our State Department and Department of Defense uh, but she added she doesn't envision a U.S.-only solution to the deteriorating situation. So what she's saying there, hey, if the United States has troops there, it's a part of an international effort, not an American invasion, if you will, of Haiti. Do you believe that that makes sense, having an international force that includes U.S. troops? Absolutely. I 100 percent agree with uh, uh, General Richardson. I know her very well. She knows what she's doing. And we need people that speak the language, some form of the French language that can communicate with the Haitian people. And they need to be Haitian-led, uh, Roland. We're going in supporting the Haitian police and the Haitian army uh, as we would go in and do this operation. But this needs to be happening now. We need to have people on the way to Haiti now to establish security and provide food and open the chain so people can get gas and water and food and medicine and open the hospitals back in Haiti. The gangs have taken the damn hospitals out. When this happened in Gaza, everybody go get all pissy about it. It's happening in Haiti every day. Hospitals taken down, food being, being uh, stolen and or uh, prevented from getting the people that need it. We need that same noise to be made about Haiti. Matt? There are people, too. Matt? Yes, uh, General Honoré, my question is kind of in the same vein. Is, is there a recent example of a circumstance where the United States sent in a security force to uh, stabilize a region and then handed it over to the government that you can think of that would be, um, you know, appropriate for an example of what we should be doing in this circumstance? Well, let's, let me tell you that. We've been to Haiti about five times and left. We're still in South Korea over 60 years. We're still in Germany over 70 years. Uh, the places that we have been successful in making peace, we're still there. We went, we didn't leave. That should have been the case in Haiti. With a cooperative standing up and supporting the government of Haiti, just like we supported the governments in Iraq and to a certain point in Afghanistan, we've never done that long term in Haiti. We've always gone in with the intention of hurry up, get in, and get the hell out. Because for obvious reasons, that's not a place a lot of Americans want to hang around. But Haiti has a lot to offer. They have the capacity to fill a lot of the needs we need in terms of skilled workers and for us to, uh, to invest economically. We invested in Taiwan. We invested in China. We invested in Vietnam. We've never made a substantial investment to help the economy of Haiti. Without an economy, this is what we end up with is a contraband economy. We could do better than that, Roland. Absolutely. Uh, Talik, go ahead, right ahead. No, I, I would I would say, you no. Know, thank you, General, for your for your service. I think, as you mentioned to, mentioned before, today and forever, we must listen listen to Haitians, let Haitians tell the story, let, let's engage with Haitian journalists. Uh, I, I think it's, it's clear to point out, as you mentioned before, there has been close to almost 400,000 people being displaced from violence. And uh, I, I would like to ask you, like, what is what do you think is the need outside, in addition to the resources, of uh, the federal government stopping deportations of Haitians uh, from the United States back to Haiti as, 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 as an importance as well. Well, one of the things we need to stop the exploitation of the Haitian workers. You know how much a person making Haiti working in a garment factory? About $3 a day. Making shirts that sell in New York for $130 a day. And they stitch most of the baseballs that are used in the United States. That's a crying damn shame for American companies to go there and paying people, talking about a living wage, I'm talking about $3 a day, Roland, is to go on a living wage, is what they pay people in Haiti. We need to change that. There are no codes. We go to Haiti and we break every damn code. We are uh, importing weapons into Haiti and giving to the gangs. The gangs have gotten out of control because of collaboration with some of the previous governments. And if we don't watch out, 
our esteem is going to be in charge of Haiti again. We know what happened the last two time he was in there, Haiti. Roland. All right. General Honoré, we certainly appreciate it. Uh, hopefully, the White House will take your advice, uh, and we will certainly uh, be posting this, and I'm quite sure they will be hearing what you had to say. We hope to, we hope to hear something this weekend from the president about Haiti. Gotcha. God bless Haiti. I appreciate it. Thanks so much, sir. Thank you. All right, folks, uh, when we come back, uh, a conversation about uh, the late, great Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm and her 1972 presidential run from someone who was right there alongside of her. That's next, right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Support us in what we do, folks. Join our Brina Funk fan club. The goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing on average 50 bucks a year. That's $4.19 a month, 13 cents a day. You can send your check and money order to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 0196. Cash App, Dollar Sat, RM Unfiltered. PayPal, R. Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale. Roland at RolandSMartin.com. Roland at RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. We'll be right back. I have something I want to tell you. I am running for president. Of the United States? Holy. I'm paving the road for a lot of other people looking like me to get elected. Brooklyn's first black representative. You're about to make history. You want to be president? You ain't no man. Maybe we should find your mother. All you got is your one vote. You sound just like every other politician. Do I look like every other politician? Freedom! Truly, you can't win. And why can't I win? I have an opportunity to make a difference. Creation! This isn't a campaign. It's a joke. The only thing anybody's going to remember is that they were a bunch of black folks who made fools of themselves. I'll kill you! See too much suffering. And I don't know how to not try. We're living it proud. I don't think I'm special. I just want to remind people what's possible. We need something that's going to make some noise. Black Panthers and Shirley Chisholm. It's like thunder and lightning. I'm going to force all the politicians to be held accountable. You're going to do all that. A school teacher from Brooklyn. Harriet was just a slave. Rosa was just a domestic. What is it you do for a living again? What's up, y'all? This is Wendell Haskins, a.k.a. Win Hogan at the Original Tee Golf Classic. And you know I watch Roland Martin Unfiltered. In 1972, Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm, who was only three years in Congress, she decided, you know what, I'm going to run for president of the United States. Didn't have a lot of money, <clears throat> did not have a huge uh, staff. Uh, some say she had a ragtag bunch of young folks and volunteers uh, who were with her trying to make this thing possible. Uh, and of course, uh, she did make history paving the way, of course, for future runs. Reverend Jesse Jackson. Senior running in 1984, 1988, and of course the successful run of the Senator Barack Obama in 2008. But what 
was it like uh, to work on that campaign, to be a student working on that campaign, to be a white student working on that campaign, to be a white male student? Well, my next guest has insight because he was on that particular team. Uh, if you watch the Netflix uh, movie, it's now available. I saw it uh, Tuesday uh, in uh, Los Angeles, and he was at the premiere. That's where we had the opportunity to meet. Uh, he has a significant role in the movie, uh, and it was something that he did in the movie that even I wasn't aware of that involves media. We're going to get to that. Uh, joining us right now is attorney Robert Gottlieb. Robert, get, glad, how you doing? Glad to have you on the show. Roland, it's good to see you. Thank you very much. So, uh, so first and foremost, before we get to talk about you know the campaign, just just initially, just your thoughts on this story um, finally getting uh, the big screen treatment. Uh, there was a documentary that was done uh, on Shirley Chisholm uh, that uh, I covered that a few years ago, but this uh, is different. This is a movie done on her, starring Regina King, directed by John Ripley. Uh, <clears throat> Roland, it has been uh, surreal beyond belief. Uh, it's been too long. We're talking about a brave, courageous woman who had the guts as a black woman to run for president of the United States, the audacity of that woman. And it's taken really all these years for uh, Mrs. C, as I called her, to receive the attention that she deserved, not only as an historic uh, story. This isn't just to teach people the history. It's to ignite people. She always said she wanted to be a catalyst for change. She wanted to be the person that lit a fire, but lit a fire within the process, not to throw the bombs, not just rhetoric, she went inside, she knew the game, she played the game, but she never lost her sense of speaking out for what she believed was right, consistent with the Constitution, what America and what America's promise has always been. The movie serves to get that message across. And hopefully, if there's one person who's touched by her and her message, who goes out there and continues the good fight, then it's all been worthwhile. I mean, this campaign was touted. Here's this black woman running, so the African-American part, the female part. So here you, a white guy, a student who got a scholarship to work in her office, uh, and here you're in college. She goes, yep, come work on my campaign. And you're like, uh, I got class. Well, no, but you, you didn't include the second line. I said, I have to call the university, and I have to call my parents. <laughs> and, and I have to tell you, um, that's true. That's true. I, um, I was part of that ragtag young group that felt that she represented the very best and the promise. You, you know, you have to remember the times we were, we, we're, we're in. We're, we're going through real hatred in the country back then. There was the, the, the racial divide. You had the Black Panther Party. You had the civil rights. You had the killings, Martin Luther King in 68, Robert Kennedy in 68. You had such, and, and the fires and, and, and the riots. So you had a real racial divide. You had the anti-war, the Vietnam War battle going on. And here I am, I'm at, uh, I'm at Cornell, and I went down to visit uh, Mrs. C and the friends I had met the summer before. I went down there dur during Christmas break just to say hello. And before I left, Mrs. C calls me into her office. And just as it's depicted in the movie, it's so real. And she says to me, Robert, I have something to say to tell you. I'm going to run for president. And after saying, what the I then say, but I, I can't. I have to call the university. I have to call my parents. And I don't, I, I, I can't do it. And she then says words to the effect, I don't believe in the word can't. So I spent the day on the phone. 
calling my parents first, by the way, and then the university. And somehow I managed by the end of the day to have the university agree to uh, uh, award me with nine credits of independent study to then spend the rest of my senior year working on the campaign. And I had to take a three credit course at George Washington University at night. That's how it unfolded. So, for, so first of all, what, what was that conversation like with your parents when you said, hey, uh, yeah, I'm going um, I'm, to I'm drop out of school. I'm going to go work uh, uh, on this black woman's campaign. <laughs> Listen, um, I called my parents knowing exactly how they were going to react. And it was go get them. There was no question. There was no debate. And I didn't call them for their permission. I called them because they were my parents, and I wanted them to know the important news. So, so, so all of a sudden, this campaign starts, and she makes this announcement. And again, y'all starting off don't have money. Democratic Party doesn't want her to run at all. Black, black leadership did not want her to run. Uh, I'm very familiar with what happened at the Gary Convention in 1972. Here we are four years after MLK's assassination. Uh, and here we are four years after uh, you had integrated um, uh, delegations at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago after the battle in Atlantic City in 1964. So we, we're only talking four and eight years after all of this uh, drama at the Democratic National Convention. Uh, and so you have black, all, all these black men who did not want her to run. In the movie, they talk about uh, Congressman Walter Fontroy, uh, you know, throwing his name in the hat only for the purpose uh, uh, there in D.C. And then you're battling, you got Speaker Willie, you got uh, later the Speaker Willie Brown in California who was dead, fat, dead set in supporting uh, McGovern uh, for the nomination. And so, you know, not only, and then she's dealing with women who are not supporting her, black folks not supporting her. And so, uh, who were y'all talking to? Who were y'all hoping to convince to vote for Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm? Listen, my, my focus was on students, but anyone working on this campaign knew damn well we would talk to anybody who would listen. We knew she was not going to be elected president, but we didn't treat the campaign as if she wasn't going to be elected president. We believed in her message, we believe that she was the right person. So we would speak to anybody. We would try to raise money. You know, you described how it was at the beginning. No support from the Democratic Party, no money. Well, guess what? By the end of the campaign, nothing changed. The only thing that changed, frankly, is that the people who we thought would serve as the core group, and that meant the feminists, that meant the white women, that meant black politicians, people who professed to really stand for the, the need to have more blacks in Congress, in the Senate, in all walks of, of public life, whether they be a woman and a man or a man. The truth is, the men only could tolerate another man. So the biggest obstacle that I became aware of, really as a novice, was that the people who you would have expected to serve as her core, they all disappeared. And I don't care whether it's Betty Friedan, whether it's Gloria Steinem, whether it's any of the, the, the members of the Black Caucus, by and large, they may have professed the right message of support. But at the end of the day, they were not there. I've lost your. I've lost the audio. So all of these people who were saying the right things were not doing the right things. So when this black woman has stepped up, they were kind of like, "What is wrong with her? What is she doing?" Uh, here is some of her announcement uh, that she, when she made the announcement, uh, when she went public uh, in New York. Uh, here it is. <laughs> I stand before
before you today as a candidate for the Democratic nomination for the presidency of the United States of America. I am not the candidate of black America, although I am black and proud. I am not the candidate of the women's movement of this country, although I am a woman, and I'm equally proud of that. I am not the candidate of any political bosses or fat cats or special interests. I stand here now without endorsements from many big name politicians or celebrities or any other kind of prop. I do not intend to offer to you the tired and glib cliches which for too long have been accepted part of our political life. I am the candidate of the people of America. <laughs> Fellow Americans, we have looked in vain to the Nixon administration for the courage, the spirit, the character, and the words to lift us to bring out the best in us, to rekindle in each of us our faith in the American dream. Yet all that we have received in return is just another smooth exercise in political manipulation, deceit and deception, callousness and indifference to our individual problems, and the disgusting playing of divisive politics, pitting the young against the old, labor against management, North against South, Black against White. <laughs> the abiding concern of this administration has been one of political expediency rather than the needs of man's nature. The president has broken his promises to us and has therefore lost his claim to our trust and confidence in him. I cannot believe, I cannot believe that this administration would have ever been elected four years ago if we had known then what we know today. But we are entering, we are entering a new era in which we must, as Americans, demand stature and size in our national leadership. Leadership, leadership which is fresh, leadership which is open, and leadership which is receptive to the problems of all Americans. Robert, when you uh, hear that, um, do you still get chills? Uh, and is, is her voice sort of ringing in your ear with all the conversations that y'all had? The answer is yes. And the truth is, I heard her make her stump speech thousands of times. And every time I heard it, it had the same effect on me. She was so real and so right. Every time I heard the same damn words, I would walk away and say, it's affecting me as much today as two months ago. And listening to that again, all you have to realize, the, when you talk about the importance of, of this movie, think about it. It sounded like she was talking to an audience today mm -hmm. about the realities of politics today. When she says we've, and we've entered a, a new era, that was aspirational. She was hoping we entered a new era. The truth is what we're living through in this nation needs a thousand Shirley Chisholms. That same battle that she set out to wage needs to be waged today. So it has an effect, but again, it's not only of nostalgia. It affects me in the same way as it did then. And anyone, we always felt, quite frankly, Roland, that if she can get in front personally of millions of people, she would have been elected. 
I want to. I'm, I'm going I'm to go to a break, and I want to talk about that because you were involved in something uh, that actually made history. Uh, and again, I'm watching the movie, and I go, "Wow, I didn't know that." So we're going to go to a break. We're going to talk about that that history making um, role that you played when it came to the courts and the FCC that allowed. America to hear the voice of Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm in a broad way. That's next, folks. We're talking to Robert Gottlieb, uh, an attorney in New York. He he worked on the presidential campaign of Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm in 1972. We're going to talk about that. My panel is going to have their questions, Robert, when we come back as well. Folks, you right now, you can watch Shirley, starring Regina King, on Netflix. It is available now. We'll be right back. Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. on the black table with me, Greg Carr. The Tuskegee Institute, now university, forever linked to the infamous and despicable syphilis experiments done on the poor rural farmers in Alabama and the Tuskegee Airmen, the famous heroes of World War II. But its history is about so much more. In his new book, The Tuskegee Student Uprising, author Brian Jones reveals a largely untold history, rich in radical activism, and reform. Suddenly the students are meeting these folks whose lifestyle is very different from theirs, very rural, but they're seeing them lose family members. People in their family disappear. How Tuskegee became an epicenter for Black power. An amazing history lesson on the Black Table, right here on the Black Star Network. My name is Lena Charles, and I'm from Opelousas, Louisiana. Yes, that is Zotico capital of the world. My name is Margaret Chappelle. I'm from Dallas, Texas, representing the Urban Trivia Game. It's me, Sherry Shepard, and you know what you watch. Roland Martin on Unfiltered. Attorney, uh, who uh, was a uh, staffer, campaign staffer for Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm when she ran for president in 1972. So, Robert, I'm watching the movie, and then all of a sudden there's this scene where uh, th there was supposed to be debates, and they, the networks decided, hey, she doesn't qualify. And so she then said, let's sue. And y'all are broke, y'all ain't got no money. And so all of a sudden they're trying to figure out, well, well who the heck are we gonna sit here? Uh, and uh, get to file his lawsuit, and they were like, that dude uh, wants to be a lawyer. Uh, walk us through that, uh, because in the movie, the character's looking like, I know y'all not talking about me. Listen, I, I had that look many times, but, but, but Roland, and for anyone watching this, you don't want to get me disbarred. The truth is that... Uh, uh, and, and the dialogue in the movie makes it clear that it was really brought by a, an organization, a media organization that fought for the right of, uh, of equal time. I had nothing to do with the filing of the papers. I was aware of it. But, you know, movies convey... Of course. Uh, and and uh, I was the, the logical person because I was, I was an undergraduate at Cornell... They knew I wanted to be a lawyer. I was aware of the issue. But please, don't let anyone <laughs> think that I was the guy who drafted the, the papers or went to court. I had the information, and I know I supported it with all of my heart and did soul. You, did you find the group? Was it was your, was your job to find it? How did that happen? It, um, 
I don't even know the inside story of how they came about, but I knew that they were very active, and it received a great deal of publicity that all these white male candidates were being invited on. I believe it was Meet the Press, and the person who was left out was Shirley Chisholm. So it didn't need me to start dialing the phone to say, are you interested? I'm, I guarantee you the call started coming in unsolicited by organizations that were willing to fight the good fight. So they literally sue, uh, sue the networks and the FCC rules, you must provide equal time, and that's how she was able to get national media attention. That's correct. She went on Meet the Press, and then she went one-on-one -on, -one on CBS, I know. She got a great deal, and it was just one person. She wasn't then in a group of uh, seven or uh, six or seven uh, of the other candidates. She was one-on-one, -on -one, and she was very effective. But you can only gain so much support by one appearance on TV. Wow. Uh, questions for my panel. Uh, Tylik, you're the youngest one on the panel. You get to go first. You know, I would just, uh, I think the movie was just so amazing. I, I, I want to echo, I hear it saying, like, rooms are being made because of your audacity. Rooms are being made because of your audacity. And for the young folks that's out there watching, I think we should be inspired in generations to come. Uh, I think her message, you know, echoes is intergenerational, is interracial. Um, and her story is our story. And we're standing on the shoulders of Chisholm's to be change makers, industry disruptors, fearless fighters. And I just want to thank you for your bravery, your audacity to, to, to have faith um, in this Black woman who has changed, you know, history forever. And you're a part of history. I'm grateful to, to, to have listened to this conversation and be a part of this. And I just want to say, what, what, what would your message be? What do you think Shirley Chisholm's message would be to young folks these days, especially as we're looking at, you know, this election season um, and folks who are just, you know, very complacent and uh, who don't want to be a part of, you know, politics or government or, you know, to be civically engaged. What do you think the message of Shirley Chisholm would be today to those young folks? Her message today, and by the way, I, I let me just say this first. Um, I really thank you for um, commending me. But I have to tell you, I, I don't really deserve that. And I'm not just saying that out of some false sense of, of modesty. It was, it was so natural. It, it was a, an opportunity to work for somebody who had the right message, which I'll then talk about in a second. And I didn't think at the time that I was doing anything special. I thought she was doing something special, and that's why I wanted to work with her. But at the time, it didn't take bravery on my part. It didn't take courage on my part any more than it, it, it would take courage to march in Washington against the Vietnam War or to support the black students at Cornell when they insisted on an African-American studies program. We did what we had to do in order to implement what we believed this country was supposed to stand for. As far as what Mrs. C would say today, it would be the same thing as she said then. Don't just be angry about what you see. Don't, don't just give rhetoric, because you're going to spend the rest of your life just angry and yelling about things. There's a way to, to, to stop what's happening in the country today. So young people, get off your video games, get off social media, get in the streets, march in the streets, organize, knock on every damn door. November is right around the corner. And there is no excuse. When it goes against you, don't complain, young people, when your books are being taken away from you, when you're not able to study certain topics you want to study in school, when if you become pregnant, you can't have abortion or you can't vote because you don't have the right identification. Don't complain. That would be her message today, but it's the same message. And that's what's so disheartening in many ways. We're reliving history, but it's real right now. Get off your backsides. Matt? So let me first say, I think the statute of limitations has run on any ethics complaint about you filing lawsuits. <laughs> the, okay the, 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 the lawyer on the panel would say that. You're, you yeah. are hired. Thank you. 
<laughs> I have uh, I have one question and one comment. Um, so the question is, what parallels do you see in the treatment of Black women in politics these days um, as it relates to your time with Mrs. C, any improvements or any step backs, steps back in the, the current era as it relates to the treatment of Black women in, in politics and even just the credence that they're lent? And then the comment is, thank you for doing many years of criminal defense. I tell people that is quintessential lawyering, and I appreciate you having made a career of, of that kind of work. So thank you again. Thank you. Uh, by the way, I don't think that takes courage either. I think that's, that's what our Constitution says I should be doing. As far as the politics today, you know, just see the anger and the hatred that's directed against certain minority members of Congress. Anyone of color. Look at AOC. What she has to bear, it becomes very personal. There's a hatred. There's a resentment that I, just from the outside, I'm not involved in the inner workings of political campaigns now, but I see how they are treated and how they are attacked. So I think, certainly, just as a bystander, we have come a, a long way. Just look at the numbers. But as far as the way white America looks at them, and what they are now willing to do and say against them, now that they have permission from people like Trump and others on the right, they have permission to do it without any repercussions. So we've come a long way, but there is a much longer way to go before this country is true to its ideals. Michael. All right, uh, Attorney Gottlieb, uh, thanks for coming on the show today and sharing this information with us. As the historian on the panel, I had a question about Governor George Wallace, who is uh, portrayed in the movie. And um, there's a scene uh, in the movie where Shirley Chisholm uh, makes the controversial uh, decision to go visit Governor uh, George Wallace while he's in the hospital. There was an assassination attempt on him in 1972. Uh, and he didn't—he never forgot her showing kindness to him. And in 1973, he helps her to uh, get legislation passed to raise the minimum wage for domestic workers. Can you talk about what caused her to go visit him? Because, I mean, this is Governor George Wallace who said segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever, and who ran for president in 1968. Um, for the uh, American Independent Party as uh, uh, against civil rights. What caused her to go visit him? And what, what was some of the backlash that she received from the African-American community behind that? Yeah, um, that also is, is a great question. Um, at the time when I heard that she was going, um, I my reaction was the reaction of everybody. Shirley Chisholm is going to see this racist <laughs> Right. It was unbelievable, the reaction before as well as afterward. There was a lot of controversy, and there was a lot of resentment among black voters and young students. There was a resentment. If you ask me why she did it, that's who she really was. She was mm. a sensitive, empathetic, she was a real human being with the highest morals and beliefs. And she was religious. And she felt it didn't matter what his political views were, didn't matter that he was a racist. He was gunned down. He was gunned down. He was getting a lot of attention. He was in a hospital bed. He was paralyzed. Right. That, that reflects everything anyone needs to know about her true and real character. Right. She also they, survived assassination attempts on her own life as well. That's right. There was, I, I recall hearing, I wasn't there, I was on the road, of the attempt on her life as well. Robert, last question uh, for you. Uh, that is, uh, so when you see the videos and when you see the movie, I mean, she is forceful, she is earnest, uh, she is very clear. Um, but uh, 
was she funny? Was she lighthearted? Uh, what, uh, is there any particular thing uh, or story you remember that still makes you laugh today? You know, um, so the answer is, yes, she could be funny. Um, but I always felt that she was much more uh, complex than just the political figure that people saw out there, uh, being a firebrand, and even more complex than the times I would see her in the office. The scene in the movie where some white Southern congressman approached her time and time again, saying how amazing it is that she is making the same salary as he is, and he's this Southern guy, and he mocks her. He mocks her by saying, you're making 42 five. And what would happen, every time that happened, Mrs. Chisholm would come back to the office and mimic. She was a great mimic. And I, what I saw, when I saw that movie the first time and I heard her making fun of that guy right to his face, it brought it back to me so clearly because Regina King nailed it. That's exactly how she said it. That's exactly how she would make fun of this guy. So she was a good mimic, but I never had a sense that she was having fun after leaving the office. I never had a sense that she was going out to party. Now, she may have. She didn't share all that stuff with me. But I just, I felt she was so committed to what she was doing. While she was in the office, she certainly had times of being funny or, t or, or telling a funny story. But that was so overshadowed by her real persona, which was standing up for what's right. But what people have to understand is that she knew how to play the game. So she, in committee meetings, and I attended some of those committee meetings when I was a summer intern, she went to committee meetings with Wilbur Mills, other Southern members of Congress, who until then had never seen a black woman, certainly in political office. And she managed to work with them. And that was a lesson which I know had an impact on me. Even the people who you personally detest, if they have the power, she understood how to wield her power by getting some incremental change. It was important for her to accomplish that. And she did accomplish it in many ways. Well, I think that um, th this movie is so needed. And, and I'll be honest, uh, I'm, I'm a native of Houston. And, and obviously, for me growing up, we all knew about uh, Congresswoman Barbara Jordan. Uh, and I think if you ask a lot of people in this country who was the first black woman uh, in Congress, they actually might say Barbara Jordan. Uh, so in many ways, Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm was overshadowed all of these years uh, by, uh, you know, the, the oratory of Congresswoman uh, Jordan. She was on the Watergate uh, panel, but the reality is the first black woman in Congress, in American history, was Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm. Robert, final thoughts. Um, I, I appreciate that you invited me. I really do. It's good seeing you again. And I think her message that you're getting out there and that the movie will get out there it's worth uh, everything, certainly, I've ever done. And she can really have a major impact as we move forward. Uh, well, absolutely. Robert Gottlieb, I appreciate it. Thank you for joining us uh, and appreciate your insight uh, into the late, great Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm. Thank you, Roland. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Folks, again, Shirley is airing right now on Netflix. You can check it out. A little bit later in the show, uh, we're going to share with you uh, more of what we got from the red carpet on Tuesday, including Congresswoman Barbara Lee, who worked on that same presidential campaign with Shirley Chisholm. Plus, you will hear from Raina King, uh, the producer of the movie, the sister of Regina King and Regina King, who starred as Shirley. It took them 15 years to get this movie made. Coming up next, we'll talk with the top leader of the Alabama Democratic Party regarding uh, Republican Governor Kay Ivey signing her anti-DEI bill in the state. Yeah, but they sure as hell don't mind DEI Saturdays racing up and down the football field. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. I have something I want to tell you. I am running for president. Of the United States? Holy. 
I'm paving the road for a lot of other people looking like me to get elected. Brooklyn's first black representative. You're about to make history. You want to be president? You ain't no man. Maybe we should find your mother. All you got is your one vote. You sound just like every other politician. Do I look like every other politician? Truly, you can't win. And why can't I win? I have an opportunity to make a difference. This isn't a campaign. It's a joke. The only thing anybody's going to remember is that there were a bunch of black folks who made fools of themselves. I'll kill you! See too much suffering. And I don't know how to not try. We're living it proud. I don't think I'm special. I just want to remind people what's possible. We need something that's going to make some noise. Panthers and Shirley Chisholm. It's like thunder and lightning. I'm going to force all the politicians to be held accountable. You're going to do all that. A school teacher from Brooklyn. Harriet was just a slave. Rosa was just a domestic. What is it you do for a living again? Hey, yo, what's up? It's Mr. Dalvin right here. What's up? This is KC. Sitting here representing the J-O-D-E-C-I. That's Jodeci. Right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Well, the white Republicans in Alabama have done like those in Florida and other states. Uh, by outlawing DEI. Alabama Governor Kay Ivey signed the bill uh, that, uh, again, uh, prohibits any money at state institutions from be for being used for DEI programs. The bill passed the Senate, which prohibits public uh, entities, uh, such as schools and universities, from promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion programs. The law says schools uh, cannot, cannot fund initiatives uh, that teach concepts that any individual should accept, acknowledge, affirm, or assent to a sense of guilt, complicity, or a need to apologize on the basis of his or her race, color, religion, sex, ethnicity, or national origin. This is Alabama, y'all. <laughs> Alabama. The law takes, a place, takes, takes effect October 1st. Joining us now is Joe Reed, chair of the Alabama Democratic Conference, vice chair of minority affairs for the Alabama Democratic Party. Uh, Joe, glad to have you here. Uh, I said going into break, uh, these white Republicans in Florida, Alabama, Texas, and all these other states, they damn sure don't mind DEI on Saturday afternoons. Yes. Sometimes you see them cheering, you would never think that they had the other part of uh, this racism in their hearts. And uh, the, the tragedy about all of this is that this state needs so much. It's so far behind. And there are good people in this state, blacks and whites. But somehow, the political leadership has always come forward with the worst possible ideals that really can, that really reflects on this state. It's just, it's bad. And, and I don't know, I'm, I've been around a long, long time. And it strikes me that the, the, the legislature of Alabama is one of the most anti-consumer legislatures in the country. 
you know, ever see the legislature come up with anything that's good, that's try to help people, uh, try to help this state, uh, move this state from the back of the line on every conceivable issue that is good. Alabama just, if it's bad, we rush to it. We fight, to, we fight for last place. And it's so tragic. And it's tragic that our leadership in this state has not done anything that will try to help move this state forward. And what has happened is that these folk don't want, they know their forebearers, they know they are, and are, and are still wrong, so they want to hide it. So they fix it so you can't talk about it. Well, hell, people are going to talk about it anyway. That ad bill has passed it out to where the paper is written on because nobody's going to pay any attention to it. I know I'm not. I know there are other people who are not going to do it. And I just don't see why it is, and it really bothers you because, you know, I, I, I live in it every day. And it just bothers you that you never see the leaders of this state come forward with good things for the people of Alabama. So we keep embracing mediocrity. We keep embracing racism. But I thank you for having me on this program. Well, but, but here's the deal, though, Joe. I mean, Bob, look, I, I called this years ago. Uh, I, I, my book is called White Fear, How the Browning of America is Making White Folks Lose Their Minds. And what you see, uh, the attacks on critical race theory, the attacks on affirmative action, the attack on, on woke, they want to brand everything as woke. This is the latest deal. And so what this is about is about power. It's about, and, and this is what I, I, I've been saying, the reason this thing is, e is escalating as quickly as it is. After the death of George Floyd, that movement, that was the first black-led movement in American history that a majority of Americans supported. It was the first time in history. And what scared these white folks was they saw young white people pissed off, protesting. The massive protests all around the world wasn't just black folks. They saw white kids angry and upset. And these white folks said, oh, hell no. We cannot have uh, these young white folks learning about true American history. That's why they hate the 1619 Project. That's why they don't want certain books to be read, because they are scared to death of younger white folks learning the real story of American history, not that BS that we were all taught. And they said, no, nah, we got to put a stop to this quickly, otherwise we going to lose control of this whole thing forever. That's what Alabama is doing. That's what Florida and DeSantis is doing and Abbott in Texas and Lee in Tennessee and on and on and on. You said it so much better than I. You said it so much better than many others. And that is they, they and if there's a real hope, it is in the young people, in particular the white young people, because there are some changes. You mentioned earlier about the guy running, running a touchdown uh, on the football field. Well, people applaud those guys. People uh, will say they're not so bad after all. And I, I, I made, I cracked a joke a while back. I went before a group to talk and I said, no, I said, I really feel sorry because I don't see any white boys playing football. And I, it, 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 it was a joke, but my point I was trying to make was that Alabama, George Waters stood in the schoolhouse door, uh, all, all over the South, Ross Barnett did what he was going to do, took Kennedy to bring out the truth of that. So uh, all the farmers in Arkansas, and also uh, the man with the ax handle over in, in Georgia. And I say that because all of that noise and all of that fear and all of that hate was really pushed out and played with and talked about 
And now those same schools got 6 or 70% of the black football players on their teams. And, and those, those students are going to school together. As they're in college together. They're doing everything together. And you're so right. That's the thing that they really don't want to happen. They want to keep us divided by disliking or hating each other as opposed to really uh, sitting down at the table of brotherhood uh, and sisterhood. Uh, that's, that's, that's the big challenge. And they don't want that to happen, but every, they, can, they can burn books, they can prohibit books, they can do everything negative about books. It is not going to stop the progress that young people are insisting on, and already, already, they are raising questions about the slavery and why and how can you justify it? How can you uh, uh, bring it about, bring discussions about? They don't want nobody to talk about that. Mm -hmm. And that's why they are trying to live a best. They're trying to live a best to stamp it out. But no, 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 no army is stronger than an idea whose time has come. Well, and I, the time is here. Yeah, well, I certainly hope uh, that some of these athletes and their parents listen to Birmingham Mayor Randall Woodfin and say, uh, we ain't going to Alabama, we're not going to Auburn. Uh, and I'm telling you right now, all it takes is two or three. Hell, it just takes one. And I'm telling you, that if black athletes do what that brother in Mississippi did when he said, I'm not playing football under that state flag with the Confederate emblem, them white folks change that flag in a heartbeat. If, yes. if, if, these, if, if, if two or three black athletes say, I am not going to Alabama, I am not going to Florida, I am yep. not going to these schools in Texas because they hate, uh, because of anti-DEI laws, these white legislators will be racing uh, to the floor to change the laws because they know damn well, well they can't win nothing without black athletes. And they Amen. Do. Joe Reed, we appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks a bunch. I'm going to go to a right. quick, go, go, go quick break, come back with my panel. We're going to pick, pick up on this. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Terry and I, we couldn't play in the white clubs in Minnesota. It felt like such a, um, you know, strength through adversity type mm -hmm. moment that I think black people just have to go through. You know, we have to figure it out. You know, right. we make we make you know lemons out of lemonade. But there's a reason we rented a ballroom, did our own show, promoted it, got like 1,500 people to come out. Clubs were sitting empty. They were like, where's everybody at? And they said, they're down watching the band you wouldn't hire. So it taught us not only that we had to be, we had the talent of musicians, but we also had the, ta had the talent of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like a seat at the table. It's like, no, let's build the table. That's right. We got to build the table. And, That's right. and that was the thing. And of course, after that, we got all kinds of offers. Of course. Right, to come play in the clubs. But we didn't do it. We you said, like, no, we're good. No, we're good. We're good. And that's what put us on a path of national. And of course, when Prince made it, then it was like, okay, we, we see it can be done. Farquhar, executive producer of Proud Family. Bruce Smith, creator and executive producer of The Proud Family, Louder and Prouder. And you're watching Roland Martin. You know, I, I was I, I was somewhat disappointed, uh, Michael, that after Mayor Randall Woodfin made his call, um, other other p politicians did not join him. And just like I was disappointed that other pro athletes, even those retired, 
who didn't go pro, who played college ball in Florida, uh, didn't step up and join Emmett Smith when he blasted Florida. They're anti-DI, anti-DEI. And it was the same when I called out Texas A&M for their treatment of Kathleen McElroy, journalism professor. And I said the sa same thing. And a lot of former athletes at Texas A&M, I got a call from some, but they didn't go public. They didn't say anything. Right. And, and, what, and what these black politicians and black athletes must understand is uh, silence don't help nobody. And I t if more and more black, if more black, if not just more, if some black athletes had said, I'm standing with Emmett, I agree. And right. then it builds and builds. Otherwise, it looks like, oh, you said it, nobody responded, whatever. Oh, Ren Mayor Woodfin, oh, it's just you talking, whatever. Y'all not, y'all good with it, we can just move on. Yeah, Roland, uh, there, there's so much here. Um, and we see this moving across the country. Uh, and this is something really that Donald Trump unleashed uh, going back to September 2020 when he uh, did his executive order banning um, uh, banning critical race theory being uh, used in uh, training for federal employees. And we, we've seen all this explode from there. Uh, yes, uh, other athletes need to step up and uh, uh, boycott. Yes, they need to speak out. Other politicians need to speak out, et cetera. But too many of us are scared and complacent. And I said the same thing back when Colin Kaepernick uh, had his protests as well. I said African Americans need to stop watching uh, the NFL, stop buying jerseys, stop buying tickets in protests. And we, we understand when we work collectively and leverage our economics to enforce our political agenda, we have a much better chance of winning. So uh, one of the things that uh, I, I would say that needs to take place in Alabama, if it hasn't already taken place, is one, we saw in Florida, we we saw hundreds of black churches started teaching African American history inside the churches as um, a, 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 as a uh, rejection of the social studies standards coming from the Florida Department of Education and the Stop Woke Act uh, that uh, Governor Ron DeSantis signed into law. It's uh, called Faith in Florida. It's a whole initiative in Florida. Two, I would say, if I was African Americans in, in Alabama, I would say, okay, Governor Kay Ivey, you're against the div divisive concepts being taught. Well, teaching about George Washington in school is divisive because he owned 318 slaves. Teaching about Thomas Jefferson is divisive because he raped Sally Hemings and he owned collectively 600 slaves in his lifetime. Teaching about Andrew Jackson is divisive because he signed the Indian Removal Act of 1830, which forced Native Americans uh, on on the Trail of Tears into Oklahoma, and one-third of the people with them were African Americans. So I would flip them on them and talk about all these other things that you're teaching that are divisive and, and attack them that way as well. So we need to fight back. You know, um, Matt, uh, yesterday, uh, Michael Harrod of The Root uh, said that, that if you actually take this law, you could literally apply it to football because the NCAA requires DEI programs, and Alabama is an NCAA school. He said, so, uh, he said, it would be great if somebody actually filed a lawsuit on that behalf, he said, and that would really shake them up, he said, because the NCAA literally requires it. And he said, and this law is counter to that NCAA requirement. I said, sound like a good idea to me. I think that would be brilliant. And it's funny because that's exactly what I wanted to opine on as it relates to this situation in particular. I think what we need to do is clog the courts. I think the law is patently unconstitutional. The fact that they write something as vague as divisive concepts as it relates to race and sex and other things, uh, that doesn't give any rubric for what is considered permissible under the law and what's not permissible under the law. And the same thing happened here in Texas when they passed their anti-DEI law. So I think what needs to happen is, uh, and I, I'm hoping somebody walks into my office one day with this exact complaint so I can file the suit, but frankly, what needs to happen is somebody needs to say, look, my children have a right under the 14th Amendment to an equal uh, teaching of not only true history, but their own history. The idea that some contingent of students, a very large contingent of students, 
will be taught an abridged version of history that applies to them, to me, seems to run afoul of the 14th Amendment and equal protection just per se. And I think the problem is these legislatures have run roughshod over the Constitution, despite being the people who usually crow about it. And when somebody files a lawsuit, um, I think it would be borne out that these are just not constitutionally written and they don't pass constitutional muster. Now, the obvious problem is when you have conservative courts that are reviewing that, you can't have any hope that the Fifth Circuit, or I guess in this cir this circumstance, the Eleventh Circuit, is going to do the right thing necessarily in construing the law. But that, to me, seems to be the way to attack this, because these laws are clearly political rhetoric. They are not actually laws that are written well, and they're not laws that provide any permissible basis of what you can do and what you can't do. So I think that's a genius idea, because as you mentioned from the beginning, the reality is nobody has any problem with DEI when it relates to sports, when it relates to uh, anything that they get enjoyment from. But when it comes to something that makes them feel bad, i.e. the true history that shows uh, a history of, of abuses and, and injurious actions by white people against black people and people of other uh, races, then it now becomes a problem. And I think that lawsuit would be genius because it would be it would force them to recognize that you're okay with black people in one context and you have a problem in another context and that doesn't comport with this idea um, that you're anti-DEI, particularly if the NAAC, uh, NCAA excuse me, uh, requires that because you wanna see them run down the football field at Tuscaloosa and this would make it hard for that to happen. Tyler. Yeah, I would say, you know, they don't care about your di diversity but want you to run a ball. They don't care about your equity so they keep you from voting and having access to the ballot. They don't care about your inclusion, so they block history books and banned books. I think it ignores the systemic inequalities and historical disadvantages that played in this country, the, the, telling the true history of what's happened in this country. What we see happening from Governor Ivey is an agenda of white supremacy. She's an agent of white supremacy and, and trying to take us back. Uh, but, you know, we must do all we can to organize and strategize, whether that's in the courts, in the streets, uh, to 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 really fight this fight this off, um, but I, and I think once we look at it, when we look at affirmative action, you know the truth of the matter is that uh, it has always been white women that have been the the benefit of affirmative action. So we look at DEI and affirmative action. Uh, she's she's only you know t taking back you know the privileges that got her to to where she is right now outside of her her own privilege of, uh, of whiteness, but it, it's, it's an agent of white supremacy, and, and, it's, and they're trying to take us back to a time, and we must do all we can to keep the fight up. Uh, absolutely. That's what we must do. Um, first of all, uh, Michael, uh, Tylik, uh, and Matt, uh, thank you for joining us uh, on today's show. Uh, certainly appreciate it. Thanks a bunch, gentlemen. Um, folks, when we come back, uh, Congresswoman Barbara Lee from the red carpet of Shirley. We'll also hear from Regina King talking about how hard it was to get this movie made. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Next on the Black Table with me, Greg Carr, the Tuskegee Institute, now university, forever linked to the infamous and despicable syphilis experiments done on the poor rural farmers in Alabama, and the Tuskegee Airmen, the famous heroes of World War II. But its history is about so much more. In his new book, The Tuskegee Student Uprising, author Brian Jones reveals a largely untold history, rich in radical activism and reform. Suddenly the students are meeting these folks whose lifestyle is very different from theirs, very rural, but they're seeing them lose family members. People in their family disappear. How Tuskegee became an epicenter for black power. An amazing history lesson on the black table, right here on the Black Star Network.
am Joe Marie Payton, voice of Sugar Mama on Disney's Louder and Prouder, Disney Plus. And I'm with Roland Martin on Unfiltered. She is a sitting member of Congress, Barbara Lee. She was running for the, she ran for the United States Senate uh, in California. Uh, but she got her start working on the presidential campaign of Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm in 1972. I was in Los Angeles on Tuesday for the red carpet uh, of the Netflix, Netflix movie uh, Shirley, starring Regina King, directed by John Ridley, and got an opportunity to chat with Congresswoman Barbara Lee. What's happening? How you doing? Yeah, how are you doing? Uh, you look like you and I got the memo in terms of what we're going to wear. Come on, this is a significant event now. Come on, we got to honor our sister, our friend Shirley Chisholm. I'll tell you, long overdue. And I'm so excited. Uh, how do you feel to see finally this story being told? Uh, because when you think about so many of our black politicians, very few, I mean, that was a, it was a Showtime movie with Adam Clayton Powell. The very, very few of our folks uh, who are in politics. Well, you, you know, that's how I got involved in politics, uh, was through Shirley Chisholm's presidential campaign. And uh, now, fast forward to today, there's so many people who don't know her. And today I was thinking about that. How can anyone not know who Shirley Chisholm was, her legacy, who she was as an elected official, first black woman elected to Congress to run for the presidency, first woman to run for president. Also her agenda, as she was a progressive black woman. She was early on uh, the board of uh, the National Association of uh, Reproductive Rights. Uh, she was uh, spoke fluent Spanish. You know, she taught, she was against the Vietnam War. I mean, this woman was amazing. She was far ahead of her time. And so the timing of this film can't be better time. Which group, oh, she also was a co-founder of, uh, okay, okay, I keep getting them mixed. There are two groups. There's a Dorothy Hyde group, uh, National Council of, uh, oh man, what's the group? Council of, of Black Women, NC, NCNW, National yes, Council, yes, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. I was, keep, keep, I was keep getting confused. Uh, but not only the, those things that she did, um, Talk about from your perspective uh, of, again, uh, seeing her, seeing her in action. Seeing her in action gave uh, myself a lot of confidence that black women can lead. Uh, she was empowering. I mean, she cared about people and she was very smart, but she always uh, cared about people who she was trying to educate, first of all, about the importance of the political process. And uh, she was a very sensitive woman, though, and I've seen her uh, behind closed doors when she cried a lot. She was very vulnerable in many respects. So she uh, demonstrated that tough love uh, and that brilliance. But she was a very compassionate and passionate uh, and sensitive woman. I, I reminded somebody earlier, I was talking, telling the audience, that uh, that 1972 convention in Gary, a lot of folks don't realize they were not embracing her. They were trying to draft a man to run. I was there, and let me tell you, uh, I was there trying to get Shirley Chisholm the endorsement. And I'll never forget uh, the difficulties we had. And so for some reason, my sister and I decided we were going to get some T-shirts, and we wore them on the floor of the convention. And Jet Magazine took a picture of us and said, get your S together. <laughs> And it was a jet, and that was the point. We wanted people to come out of that convention, these delegates, supporting Shirley Chisholm. So I mean, here you had this black political convention. Uh, you were four years removed from King's assassination. And here you have these black men who don't want to support their sister, and she had already announced. Yeah, and uh, it was just, to me, I couldn't quite understand it because uh, she was the first black woman elected to Congress, so she knew what she was doing. She had more experience, first of all, than anybody at that convention. 
And secondly, she wanted to unify the black community and unify people in this country who were shut out. And she understood what coalition politics was. And she understood, though, that we had to be black and proud and unbought and unbossed in order to bring people along to have a larger uh, multiracial, multi-generational coalition. And so she uh, knew, though, <laughs> in the film, I think, kind of shows that interaction, what the deal was. But I was there, boy, let me tell you, I wanted her there. I was fighting. I wore my T-shirt. I said, no, uh-uh. And uh, myself and the delegates from the from Northern California, those who were of us who were active, went there determined. Right, she was so you, of course, were on the staff of Congressman Ron Dellums. Uh, uh, and this man here plays Ron Dellums uh, in the movie. So what? So what kind of a? So what kind of a lesson that you have to t teach him uh, about your former boss? Well, first Shirley Chisholm had to teach me a lesson, and she had to tell me, Barbara, this is politics. Barbara, little girl, she to the day she died called me little girl. She said, tell my brother to come home. It's for him. He, I forgive him. I understand what he went through. And of course, she had to work on me. But finally she did, and, and I understood what real loyalty and what true love and what real uh, friendship meant because she showed me, because I was upset. I was upset when she went to see George Wallace. I was mad. I wanted to leave the campaign. But I have to tell you, uh, at that convention, I was really sh uh, shattered. My, my my dreams, my aspirations, my idealism, but Shirley brought me back, and here she was the one, and she brought me back to where I ended up working for Ron Dellums as an intern. I worked for him for 11 years. He was my best friend. He was close to Shirley, as Maria can tell you. Uh, he loved Shirley Chisholm, and uh, this man was a statesman. You knew Ron, and you know how close we were, and I managed his office, and I've seen him through all kinds of crap, and he stood tall first chair of the Armed Services Committee. He taught me everything about the defense budget. I mean, he was, and you you really played this role quite well. You, you were Ron in that, in that movie. That's the biggest compliment I can get. I really appreciate that. Really? Uh, <laughs> the only thing is you had an alpha man like Ron. Uh, but <laughs> See, Ron's my alpha brother, so you know. Now, now, now uh, look, he was an iconic figure. So how did you prepare for that role? Well, I mean, like you said, he was an iconic figure. So there was so much footage to kind of reach from. I started with his book. And then um, from there, I just started looking up stuff and seeing speeches and videos of his, interviews of his. And, I mean, it was, a, it was a wonderful journey because Ron is an incredible guy. And so to go down that rabbit hole, so to speak, and really, like, listen to him speak and watch him develop as a speaker over years and years and years, it was just... It was like going back to college. He never used a note when Ron spoke. Ron would, and I remember one time he wanted me to represent him at a conference in Mexico, in, uh, uh, I think it was Me Ciudad de Mexico. And uh, I said, no, I can't do that, Ron. I can't represent you and speak at this major conference. I think Angela Davis was there. He said, why not? And he sat me down in his office. He said, look, you know more than what you're going to, the audience knows. This is what you have to do. This is just how you think about that. He said, and relax. He said, because you know this. And I got to, me <laughs> I got down there and believe you me, his words came back and I, he said, I did great. Everyone told him that that was a wonderful speech I gave, but I was so nervous. I was representing him first of all, but then giving the speech because, you know me, I like my little talking points so I don't ramble and go off script and he he was so brilliant with his uh, oratory skills that I always felt like there was no way I could do that. I want to get your thoughts again on, on this now being made a story for all to see across the world. I'm so humbled and honored right now. Um, it's been a long time coming and just to have her story told the right way, the most poignant way that can be, I'm so blessed. It couldn't have come at a better time as this with all the turmoil our country is in right now. And to have young people to come out and see this, that is my biggest fight, to have young people to come out and see it. So I'm just elated. You know, being her goddaughter, it just, it's a whole new thing. I'm just so happy. This is just the beginning. Final thoughts for you. Go see the movie. Go see the movie. Get galvanized, get out and vote. Right. Yeah. Right. I appreciate it. Let me conclude by saying one thing. I want to uh, just say a couple things about Regina. What an, an unbelievable, brilliant actress she is. She embodied not only Shirley Chisholm's uh, oratory skills, her accent, her persona, but her spirit. 
And also, I have to just salute uh, Christina Jackson. For me to meet someone playing me, it was like meeting me, me meeting me. And she did a wonderful job as Barbara Lee in the movie. <laughs> Congressman, always good to see you. I appreciate it. All right, folks, going to a quick break. We come back, we'll hear from Raina King and her sister, Oscar-winning actress Regina King, about their long, arduous battle to get Shirley May. Watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause too long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Check some money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Hey, what's up, y'all? I'm Devon Franklin. It is always a pleasure to be in the house. You are watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Stay right here. Regina King and her sister Raina King have a production company, folks, and it has taken them 15 years to get this movie about Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm made. I chatted with Raina and Regina on the red carpet on Tuesday in Los Angeles. <laughs> How you doing? Look at you. Well, you know, look at this. She was a special woman, so you got to. And, and she was all put together. You are very all put together. <laughs> You're giving it Shirley vibes. Absolutely. absolutely. Well, see, I'm from Houston, so uh, I I grew up Barbara Jordan, but they but the, the, they they were they, they together giving them hell. Exactly. Exactly. Absolutely. Yes, they were. Yes, they were. Uh, how long have y'all been trying to do this story? This has been 15 years. 15 years? 15 years. So this has been a long road, well-traveled, and worth every minute of it. Did it go through all the different folk? Went diff a lot of pivots. <laughs> a lot of pivots, but I'm a firm believer in timing, and this was the right time for many, many reasons. And that's being partners with Netflix and having not just bringing Shirley to the country, but to the world on a global platform. Um, her name should not be forgotten at this point. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and 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 that's the thing a lot of people don't understand. The stuff all the stuff one goes through to when they finally actually see it, they don't realize that backstory. That backstory is something. Wait, that backstory is a movie into itself. It, it the making up. <laughs> is that what's next? The making up. Yeah. The, the scenes of Shirley. Yeah, the backstory is is something, and um, you know, it's like a puzzle piece, and putting the puzzle together, and you know, sometimes you know we have a lot of things going on, so we have to stop at a place, and 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 then okay, we pick it back up again, and then we stop again, we pick it back up again, but it's been one of our first projects that we talked about when we started our production company, and 15 years. Um, Sometimes it doesn't happen. So to see it come to fruition, and this is for Shirley, uh, it's a beautiful thing. Can't wait to see it. Thank you. All Thank right. you. I appreciate it. Thanks a bunch. Hello. You look so handsome. Well, you know how to get so royal. How to get dressed up for you. How to get dressed up for you. Yes. Well, I appreciate dressed up for Shirley. Uh, for you and Shirley. Okay. Uh, your sister said this has been a long road. This has been a journey. It is. It has been. It has been. But here we are. Why did you want to tell this story? Because too many people did not know who Shirley Chisholm was, who she is, um, that she is a part of the fabric of America, uh, that so many uh, 
um, things that have improved our life over the past 40 years or so have been because of legislation that she put into effect, that she wrote up with people across the aisle. Um, so it's important. When did you first learn about it? You know, it's funny because Raina and I are four years apart and we went to different schools. I first learned about her probably in like the third or fourth grade. I was lucky enough to have a teacher during Black History Month that chose Shirley was one of the people to teach about on one of the Black History Month days. And so we, we got a little two minute snippet of an introduction to Shirley. Then later on in life, our mother exposes to a bit more. You know, I, I think I, I left that uh, lesson with just knowing that she was the first black woman that was a congresswoman. And then my mother let us know about a little bit more and let me know that you were a year old when she ran for president. And then we started doing our own research in our 20s and we're like, we don't even know um, a lot about her. Yep, absolutely. Well, being from Texas, I know we know about Barbara Jordan, so yeah. now folks will know about Shirley Chisholm. Yes, absolutely. Always good to see you. Absolutely, darling. And we'll chat later. Mm. Always, babe. Mm. Always. Thank you. You know it. Folks, uh, Netflix is airing Shirley as we speak, so y'all can check it out. That's it for us. Uh, listen, support us in what we do. Uh, look, the work that we do, y'all, uh, listen, I I'm out here. We meeting with these ad agencies, Group M and Publicis and Dean Sue and all these folks uh, trying uh, to, get, to get these clients to um, uh, allow us to tap into the $340 billion being spent every single year on advertising. These upfronts are going on right now. Magna's having theirs next week. And so uh, we are trying to see to make it happen, but your support is absolutely crucial for the work that we do. Our goal is very simple, to get 20,000 of our fans contributing on average 50 bucks each. That's a million dollars. Y'all, that is huge. I need you to understand to run the Black Star Network is $195,000 a month. $195,000 a month. That's rent, that's staff, that's equipment, uh, you name it, all the things that we have to do for this show, for Roger Bahamas Daily Show, for the weekly shows that we have as well. We wanna, we wanna start other weekly shows. Uh, I would love to start a, another business show, start a health and wellness show, uh, start a cooking show. But at the end of the day, all that stuff costs money. So your support matters. And so when I started this, I did not wanna charge people subscriptions. I see, you know, uh, Media Hassan and some other people out there, they're the launching media ventures and they've got subscribers and they're contributing to Patreon. Well, I didn't want to do that. I wanted this to be open to everybody. I wanted everyone to be able to access the content that we have. And so that's why we did not charge a subscription fee. So we created a fan club for you to give. Uh, we don't see in hats and shirts and bumper stickers and mugs and things like that. All the money that's given goes right back into the show. So your support matters. So do me a favor. Uh, send your check and money order to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Hey, you YouTube folks, hurry the hell up, hit the like button, y'all. We should easily be at 1,000 likes. Uh, Cash App is Dallas side, RM Unfiltered. PayPal's R. Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale, rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com. Uh, and of course, download the Black Star Network app. Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV, YouTube. Y'all heard the hell up. It's 133 away from 1,000 likes, okay? A bunch of y'all commenting, hit the like button, YouTube folks. We should always hit 1,000 likes minimum every single day. So let's get going. Uh, you can also watch our 24-hour streaming channel. Uh, be, be, in addition to the Black Star Network app, you can watch our streaming channel on um, uh, Amazon, uh, Amazon, um, Amazon News by going to Amazon Fire. You can tell Alexa, play news from the Black Star Network. You can also watch us on Plex TV, Amazon Freebie, Amazon Prime Video. Also, be sure to get my book, White Fear, 
how the browning of America is making white folks lose their minds available uh, at books, bookstores uh, nationwide. And so uh, let's do this here. Why don't you start rolling the names of our uh, contributors uh, and uh, I'm gonna sign off when these folks get these likes up to a thousand. They messing around. We had 917, so y'all hurry up. 83 gets us there, come on, 82. Y'all messing around on YouTube. Y'all been talking and commenting and posting on your comments. We should easily be at a thousand likes. And so I'm gonna sit here until y'all, come on, I'm looking at it right now. I'm looking at it. That counter needs to be moving. It needs to be moving, so y'all come on. 82, 82 people hit the like button, we'll hit a thousand likes. Understand, the likes plays a role in the algorithm for people to be able to come back and see the videos that generates revenue for the show. And so a bunch of y'all who are freeloading, uh, y'all can help us out uh, by simply uh, helping us increase our likes with the show. So uh, please do that. Now we had 945. Come on, y'all, it's 55 left, let's go. I'm gonna keep haranguing y'all till y'all get it. All right, 45 more, let's go. We had 955, y'all see the name scrolling here. So a bunch of y'all over here riding for free. So let's go, go ahead and give, uh, go ahead and click the like. Y'all, it's a free, it's free. Click, like, that's all it takes. That's all it takes. So there's 45 more for us to get to 1,000 likes. That's all you gotta do. Uh, and then I'll be out of here. Uh, tomorrow I am hosting the uh, Friendship Public Charter School Teacher of the Year event. I think it's like the seventh or eighth year in a row. So uh, I'm gonna be, uh, we'll be live tomorrow night uh, from DC from that awards program. So I'm looking forward to that. Let's go y'all, hurry up. Uh, 10 more. Uh, and also, y'all yo, gotta tune in on Monday. This black preacher literally said, name one law that Donald Trump signed that goes against the Bible. He dared his congregation. I'm gonna answer his ass on Monday. Oh, y'all have got to tune in. I'm a deal with homeboy. Yeah. Matter of fact, Carol might need to book it. We gonna try to book him on the show. Yeah, Carol, that's what you gonna do. I don't care. Let's see if he come on this show and face me. I'm gonna give him more than one law that Donald Trump signed that was against the Bible. Yeah, I got something for you. Deal with it, uh, uh, Carol, it's gonna happen. All right, y'all, holla.